Well, good morning. Um, a little bit about me. My background is a uh, uh, University of Manitoba grad. I uh, started my career working for an agriculture chemical company. Uh, from there, I was an ag rep in Saskatchewan for a number of years and then have been involved in doing investment attraction work, uh, working trying to uh, make sure companies knew about opportunities to invest in both Saskatchewan and Alberta. Um, when I retired, I uh, ran into a friend of mine, Mr. Rob Syke, who uh, has an ag tech company that he was starting at the time called AgVisor Pro. He asked if I could help him with some business development. I did that, I am still doing that. But um, along with that, I uh, ran into a company from Switzerland, Vivant, uh, who I met at an ag tech conference, a virtual ag tech conference out of San Francisco. And uh, I, I saw their description and I thought, I gotta meet these, these people. So uh, retirement didn't last very long and uh, because of this exciting company that I worked for. So Vivant was uh, started by Carol Plummer and Nigel Walbridge, they are signal people. So they installed Wi-Fi in the British and in the Dutch rail system. They had a company based out of the UK that uh, did that kind of work. They also, a number of other rail lines throughout the world. And uh, they sold that company, which uh, when they did that, they moved to Switzerland and uh, started exploring biological uh, signals and first playing around with signals in Nigel, plugging uh, electrodes into him to uh, see what electrical signals are in people and uh, I thought that wasn't that much fun, sticking electrodes in himself, so he tried playing with plants. And so that's really where the basis of Vivint started. It's a certified B company, if you're familiar. That's a certification, really an environmental and social responsibility that's really based out of Europe. You'll see it, there, there's not a lot of companies that we would see here that are uh, B certified. Um, I think Nestle is, um, and companies like The Body Shop, so uh, how they treat their people and how they treat the environment. So that is a little bit of background, so plant electrophysiology. Uh, first I'll, I'll go into, we'll talk a little bit about plant electrophysiology, uh, plant-based intelligence, how to use this technology for production, uh, a little bit about our, our sensors, our signals, um, and how to use this as a management tool and partnerships that we work with to utilize the data that we collect um, and make it available to farms. Um, I, I guess one thing that uh, most of this technology at this point we are using in controlled environments there's some work that's going on in in other broader acre crops but uh, right now we're we're focusing on controlled environments vertical farm systems greenhouses those kind of things so um, so plants have a number of information networks. Um, this has enabled them to survive and to be on this planet longer than we as human beings have been here. So they've been able to adapt based on a number of systems within them, um, whether that's you know the information flows that are mentioned there. Um, they have chemical signals, uh, mechanical signals, and electrical signals. So uh, a chemical signal, so when you cut your lawn, that wonderful smell that you smell is actually a stress signal that your grass is giving off. Because if you go into your clippings, that smell really isn't there anymore. And it's so that wonderful smell on a Saturday morning that when you cut your grass, that is really a chemical signal from a plant. Um, 
We'll get into electrical signals. So there's electrical signals within a plant. We put two electrodes in and we measure those signals. We know there are different signals for different stresses within a plant. We can, with those signals, we know there's different signals if a thrip uh, sucks the juice out of a leaf or if a caterpillar bites a leaf. And so those things are things that we then do analysis on. So, so plants have their own network and it's really being able to tap into those networks. So these signals have been under, we've understood there's been signals for probably over a hundred years. Scientists in India first, uh, found them or, or realized that they're there, but it's just recently that the technology has been there that we can measure them, fine tune them, and develop algorithms to distinguish between them and find out what the messaging is within that plant that those signals are telling <coughs> themselves really. So historically, we monitor the environment, we predict it, we watch the weather, we do things like that, and we try to control things that we can. Um, and it's really based on how growers feel, how their experience is, what their dad has told them, what their dad is telling them as they grow these crops. Um, the current thinking is we want to improve environmental control, so particularly in greenhouses where you can do that. You want to fine tune that um, by better sensing equipment. So if you go to a greenhouse, they have all these uh, climate control systems. They measure CO2, they measure temperature inside, outside, wind speed, uh, humidity, CO2 levels. And uh, you know, there's also a number of other plant sensors, they do slab weights to kind of measure moisture, those kind of things. So, um, so that's kind of where we are today. Forward thinking, we can tap into plants and listen and find out how they really feel about their environment, about a number of things that affect their growth. And we can interpret those signals to optimize growing conditions, diagnose uh, whether it's a disease or an insect or a nu nutrient deficiencies in plants way before you would ever see visual signs because the plants sense that. You mean, it's like when, um, you know, a number of people have, I, I have told this to, it's like when you, before you get, um, well, let's take coronavirus. You, you may have caught it on the plane coming uh, somewhere, wherever you were flying, for a few days before, you don't really feel great. You know there's, you know, you try to get, you take vitamin C, you take cold effects, you take all these things to try to fend it off, but you may end up getting something. But we do, the plants are the same way. They feel something, they know that something is infecting them, and that's when we like to find out. That's when we can, our sig we can intercept those signals and hear what the plants are feeling way before you would ever see it visually. So that's what, what we really see as forward thinking. So these signals are the plant talking within itself. That's how the roots know what's going on up there in the light. And that's how the light knows what's going on in the roots. So for instance, if it's suffering from a lack of moisture, you will know that your plants kind of shrivel up. The stomata close and the plant is saying, it's dry down here, quit letting moisture out the top. So again, you know, this current thinking where we are today about sense and control, trying to control what you can, and we really observe the crop for these stress signals. We have scouts that go out, whether it's broad acre, but even in greenhouses, they have scouts that 
All day, they're looking for stress signals in plants. Um, forward thinking, we want to tap into that intelligence of a plant. So really, the plant, what w our philosophy is, is the plant should be the best sensor you can get. You know, many times we have other sensors, we, and those are really secondary sensors to production. You assume or make some probably fairly valid assumptions that at a certain moisture level in soil, that's what your plant wants. There's some assumptions there, but we, with our technology, can find out when your plant is thirsty. That's what, because the plant knows. So how does it work? Really, we put two sensors in a plant just like that. Probably in a tomato plant, there may be, depending in a, in a greenhouse, they're about two or three feet apart. We have a filter that kind of filters out the noise that's in those signals. Um, and then that just goes to, through a computer, through one of those blue boxes you can see up here. That's our device. Um, we hook up eight plants in a row and uh, that's where uh, that box is hooked to Wi-Fi. It's really uh, a computer, a Raspberry Pi computer in that box that uh, analyzes or takes those signals. We measure signals 256 times a second. So lots of data. So this would be what we would get from a one plant. So the blue uh, dotted line is what we predict the plant would be uh, an ideal growing condition. That would be the rhythm that, uh, of the plant and that's based on the four previous days. And so that's what our uh, our machine learning puts in there. The, so uh, the green area is just a standard deviation from that. And uh, the pink line is the line of what actually the plant is experiencing in real time. So, and then the shaded uh, pink areas are areas where the plant is experiencing stress. And the challenge with those stresses is that the plant is spending its energy to survive. And when it's doing that, it's adapting to the environment and it's not doing what we are hopefully investing our money in for that plant to do. So to produce fruit, to produce whatever it is you are trying to harvest from that plant. So that's in a nutshell, but that's from one plant. We measure eight plants so we get a sampling because as you go through uh, a greenhouse, you will see, to me, eight plants look pretty close to the same. But they don't feel the same. We're seeing a fair bit of variation. A really trained greenhouse grower will know that a, well, that's not really a good plant. And I've been in plant production all my life. <laughs> No, I, I can't see it. He said, that plant won't produce as much to many tomatoes as another plant. But we can detect that quite readily. So this is an example of what we call a GGI, grouped growth index from those eight plants. Um, the higher the blue line is, that's what we're actually, those are actual measurements. The higher it is to 100%, that's 100% really of what we feel is growth potential. So the dark green areas are where there is, the darker the color, the better the growth, the less stress on that plant. And so you can see here 
These are actual, this is from an actual uh, greenhouse, but on March 19th, you can see there was a rapid decrease and where this occurred, um, within five minutes of that, the greenhouse grower would get an alert on his phone or his computer that your plants are experiencing stress. Most of the time, a greenhouse grower would know what that is. He would know he was doing a picking. Uh, in this case, it would be more than a picking because a picking would be a rapid shift downwards and then back up. But it would be likely some sort of intervention that he did. It could be a spring. It could be a number of things that caused that. It could be a climate change. Um, and then you can see the recovery period. And then back on March 28th, he was back up to really good production. What we also do is we send growers a weekly postcard, which shows them how production was over the past week, um, where his crop wasn't happy, um, where his crop was really producing well. And as of right now, the grower goes back and looks at his records. He generally knows why that was. As we get more machine learning into this tool, we will be able to identify in real time to the grower what those stresses are that have caused those red lines. And, uh, you know, he really likes to look at his data to duplicate what kind of happened there from the afternoon of the 8th until the afternoon of the 9th when he had ideal growing conditions. I, I don't know if any of you are greenhouse growers. Um, we have a greenhouse grower in Leamington, Ontario, who manage his greenhouse like an air traffic controller. He sits in front of five computer screens and that's how he runs his greenhouse. Of course, he's got people who run around and do all kinds of work, but that's how he monitors his environment. That's how he monitors a whole bunch of things within his greenhouse to ensure that he gets the best production he can get. And he's still learning. So in effect, there's what, this is an example of uh, a greenhouse that we're doing an agroscope. Agroscope is kind of like AgriFood and AgriFood Canada. It's the Swiss um, government research center. And this is uh, what they have set up with one of our devices hooked up to eight plants. Those plants, of course, are in a substrate that goes to the computer. When the plants are saying it's, um, we're experiencing a little bit of dryness, they call it drought, but my definition of drought is different than what the Swiss definition is because in drought it means a whole climactic thing, but they, they call drought any time a plant is thirsty, it's, it's experiencing drought. Um, and so what happens is the computer detects that from the plant, the computer turns on the irrigation system, and the plant gets water. So that is where the machine learning component of this really starts to come in, is now the farmer doesn't have to, if he's using this or when it becomes more widely used, we can have this, the plant can control the irrigation system. It's wild. That's, I just, when, I, when I first thought of this, I said, I got, I got to lurk into this. Like, this is pretty neat. This is um, one of the examples of what a grower would see um, in the first red circle. So this is where we have interlaid the climate data from his climate control computer into or below our data. We're working with the climate control people so we can integrate these 
um, in real time. Right now we're not quite there yet, but where the red circle is, that is where a grower did a treatment for increasing his ripening. You can see this is near the end of November. Uh, this was last year. Days are getting shorter. He wanted to push that crop before he uh, before the crop uh, was done and he took that crop out of production. But what was interesting to him and to us and to his consultants was of course he did the spraying and you can see the red line where he would have got an alert on November the 30th but was what really was interesting was he, that he knew he but what he didn't expect it was the two days that it took for that crop to recover from that stress of his ripening application so, um, you know, we're doing things, we're doing experiments and working with biostimulant companies to really get good data on how their products work in crops. So the other one was a climate change that happened where the red arrow shows the crop was decreasing in happiness, if you will. But it was kind of hard to see that if you just look at the climate data. But uh, you can see here that what was happening was his CO2 level on this line here was slowly increasing. The blue line going down, his temperature was going down. So a greenhouse, plants in a greenhouse are like a very fine-tuned machine. And you make one adjustment, it affects something else. And so here, he was given an alert and he was really puzzled as to why the alert came until this, um, until we did a machine learning analysis of his uh, crop data to come up with, okay, here's really what it is. So here's another example of, of where it can be very useful is in uh, analyzing nutrients and nutrient deficiencies. So in this case, uh, Iron deficiency was visible on a plant, and anybody who's got plants knows that. Um, and so that's where um, you would, on the top graph, that's where he starts to see it after eight days. With plant electrophysiology, you can, uh, well, you can see it um, after, uh, like two days earlier, so after six days. But with electrophysiology and machine learning, we can identify that, the plants can identify that right when they start to experience this stress right here. So this is all data scientists who, it's amazing the work that they can do to analyze signals. Anyway, that's, uh, you know, here's, here's another example. What we are finding is in crops where we thought there was certain ways, for instance, that you would grow cucumbers or peppers or tomatoes. There is a lot of variation between varieties of the same crop. So we're looking at developing recipes for very specific varieties of these crops and we're working with some of the seed companies to do that. So for instance, uh, right now in Europe, in the Netherlands, where some growers have had their energy costs gone up by 10 times this year what they were last year, they want to, <laughs> well, you want to try to manage that most of them have managed it by not growing anything this winter. But in another, I think, longer term option when prices are going to moderate, we hope, he can now grow varieties that like it a little bit cooler. And in the summer, they can grow varieties that like it a little bit hotter because 
as you know, if, if you've been following, Europe has really seen some extreme temperatures. They never, you know, 10 years ago, the Netherlands never got to 40. This year, quite a number of days they did in that greenhouse area. So from a farmer's perspective, um, this is how it works. We find out, okay, what do you want to do in your, what do you want to monitor in your greenhouse? You know you have, is there a zone that you have problems with? Is there a particular area? That's where we would put these devices. We would hook them up to eight plants. We would do consultations probably every two weeks or more if he's got more problems. Um, we would send out these alerts and we would send out our productivity scores that he would get weekly. So, um, where are we going? Typical developments. Um, we are looking at some outdoor crops, as you can see. We're looking at apples. Uh, I think there's been some interest in avocados, in vines, in, in, in the grape industry, um, you know, other fruit crops, some microgreens, uh, outdoor crops like tomatoes, where Nigel and Angers are standing there looking at plant breeding as an area where we can identify very early on characteristics within a plant that you can either say yes or no to that um, plant variety very early in its life. You don't need, so for instance, soil salinity is a big problem. So uh, the plant breeding companies are looking at crops that are more salt tolerant. We can tell you that in a month after that crop is growing, if it's more salt tolerant. You don't need to take it to yield. We can find out, the plants will tell you early that they don't like that soil. So, um, yeah, so some very, highly sophisticated things in, in, you know, a Faraday cage, which um, that's all science stuff. But um, the challenge too is there's a fair bit of variability in soil. That's one of the reasons why we've started in a greenhouse. But if you can understand or get a representative area, um, you can get a pretty good understanding of how your crops are doing or feeling about the various things that you want to check it for. So, some of our partnerships. We are working with, um, we've got a partnership with Ecoation. Um, Ecoation is an automation company based out of North Vancouver, um, who, do, who have robots that go up and down and monitor crops in greenhouses. And so it's really kind of cool because these things run all night. Nobody needs to see them. And they're measuring things like uh, yield potential, yield growth. We work with them because we know that as we reduce the stress, we can increase yield. And that's very important in some of these vegetable crops because they're marketing organization or their company that they're selling to, the more information you can get to them, the sooner the better. And that usually means a better price. Because if now, if you have um, an extra truckload of tomatoes this week, they'll buy it. <laughs> they'll buy anything at the right price. But they'll say, if you're gonna sell, if, if I know a month before or three weeks before, because we know that a tomato crop from flower till harvest is about a thousand hours. If you know that there's been very little stress early on, you'll know the issue, and you can manage the stress, you can then tell them, and they can put a special on, there's things they can do. But if you're backing up to the door with an extra truckload of tomatoes, uh, they, they traditionally don't want to pay that much for the, the, that load. So we're working with Ecoation. Um, Solum Technologies is a company based out of Montreal that has a dynamic lighting technology. Absolutely revolutionary. They can simulate a sunrise by utilizing the various bandwidths of light 
They got variable bandwidth of light. They're all computer controlled. They can individually, every light fixture has a little computer in it. And in a greenhouse, thousands of light fixtures, each one can be individually controlled. And so the advantage to that is we know that at certain periods of the day and at certain periods of the growing cycle, plants like different wavelengths of light. You don't need to waste energy producing light that's not going to help your crop. And that's what these lights would do. So for instance, if any of you have tried growing um, tomatoes in those little things and you grow them in your house and uh, probably not exactly the right light, you'll notice how spindly they get and they go real, real tall and then they kind of keel over and you, t come on you guys, grow properly. You can affect that by the wavelength of light that you put in and so we're working with the propagators to keep those plants relatively short with different wavelengths of light so that when those plants have to be transported, in some cases hundreds of miles, they don't start falling over and have a bunch of forage, you know, dried out uh, plants at the end. So those are some things. Solum technologies, you know, they can really simulate what really happens in sunrise and sunset and even what, I mean, I, I'm just so excited. We, it's so interesting how your watering system in a greenhouse, 10 minutes can make a huge difference. Do you put it on 10 minutes before the sunrise? Do you put it on 10 minutes after the sunrise? How do you do that? We are being able to help develop those kind of recipes with this technology because we can understand how the plant feels about that. And then, um, I guess full disclosure, AgVisor Pro, not a totally, we haven't signed a partnership agreement. I also do some work for AgVisor Pro, but the concept is now that you know what your plants problem is, we can diagnose. So it's like you go in for an EKG and you ask your, you know, you ask the technician that's hooked you all up, well, how, how did I do? They go, don't talk to me. <laughs> like, uh, I can't tell you that, you know. So it has to go to a person who reads that, who tells a doctor. So what we believe is that AgVisor Pro can collect you, connect you to that doctor, to that agronomist that can help you come up with a solution to what's bugging your plant. So you can get maximum production and there's, you know, there, there's a number of reasons for that. Um, you know, an agrologist has to be, or a, a, a certified crop advisor has to be certified in that area. And we don't want to be in the job of agronomy. We want to be in the job of, uh, of sensors, of, of finding out what's going on in your plant. There's lots of specialists out there that can come up with solutions. So Monica is here with AgVisor Pro. If anybody is interested in how they can connect people who have agronomic questions to people who can answer them. That's where we think this technology will go. But as you probably know, they have a booth here. Monica can tell you that. It's a lot of broad acre stuff that they're working with, livestock, a number of areas. So in a sense, that's what we do. It's embryonic, I would say. In, you know, there will be applications that come for broad acre as we develop this technology. It's like your first cell phone and we'll be able to add piles and piles of apps, if you will, to this new technology to, I think this is very valuable because we don't really know the potential of the genetics that we have today. We're seeing tomato growers, the best tomato growers, increasing their yield by decreasing the stress on their plants. So I think it's amazing where, where this can go.
thanks for your attention. Thanks. If, if anybody has questions, I know it, it, it's kind of, it's a whole different area and it, 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 it opens your mind. Um, it takes time, it took me time anyway, maybe I'm slow, to uh, kind of absorb this thing and, and really see where it can go. Um, we've got plant scientists, um, the best in my mind, some of the best um, plant scientists were working with Wageningen University of Technology in the Netherlands, one of the global leaders in ag, um, looking at this in their plants and have helped us and are helping themselves, utilizing these things to better understand production of crops. Just a simple question, how many, how many plants would you have to connect to to survey to get an idea of what's happening in a certain area? It, it, that's, um, so first of all, we, um, we need live power. So that's one of our challenges in a outdoor cropping situation. That's going to come, we will have um, portable uh, powered devices that are solar powered and so on. Um, typically in a greenhouse, we would do it by zone, climactic zone, because that way you have measurements that are different from one zone to another. I would say in outdoor crops, um, it depends on the variability that you're looking at within your situation of, of what you want to analyze. So, you know, we're doing work in, in, in California where we're trying to ensure that water is used efficiently. Typically, water is, of course, as everybody knows in California, water is scarce, but relatively cheap to agriculture, because it's kind of grandfathered. Um, and so you tend to overwater. We believe and they believe, and they've got a public relations challenge to show that, hey, we're not all that bad in agriculture. Here, we can prove it. We are giving your plants a drink when they want a drink. So yeah, it's, yeah. Are you, you're aware of interplant? It's no, it's um. <laughs> It's an, another approach, it seems to me, as a way to kind of communicate with plants, more of a GMO approach. I was just curious how the layperson should kind of think about these two approaches to uh, plant communication, but yeah. It's interesting because, you know, I, I think you guys are lay people. Um, you know, this is new to you. This is new to agriculture. I think there's a number of things that as we look at what are the issues that agriculture is facing, certainly there's environmental issues. Uh, if we can um, provide nutrition to crops when it needs, when it's hungry, um, if we can do conservation of water, if we can do those kind of things and produce better quantity, and we can also talk about quality, because we can produce, people are finicky when they shop. If you see, or they, I won't say you guys, but when consumers see a um, tomato that looks like it's a little misformed because it maybe didn't have water at the right time or uh, a strawberry where we're doing a lot of work and it looks kind of bumpy and it doesn't really look like the best strawberry. I'll pick the other ones. So we believe that this system can produce better looking food. It can produce food at um, with less food waste. I was at a tomato, uh, no, a pepper greenhouse, and they had a 16-foot grain truck that was filled with malformed peppers that were going to compost. There was nothing wrong with them as far as peppers go, if you wanted to do a, a stir fry or whatever. But people wouldn't buy them. In fact, the grocery store wouldn't even take them. So I think as far as, there's a lot of things we can do as far as food waste. We are doing work um, with 
vegetable storage systems where the healthier you put the crop in storage, the longer it will stay. Particular, we're doing some work with tubers um, where we can detect sprouting or when it starts, not when you see sprouts. And there's a number of regulations now, particularly in Europe, that they have, um, they can't use some of their anti sprouting chemicals anymore. Um, so now you can start processing the bins of potatoes that are showing that, hey, those tubers are coming to light. And so, you know, I think there's some really neat things that this technology can really do. You know, we've got, uh, we've got insects in the ground that we never see, nematodes. And so how do you find out if you've got a nematode? You've got to pull a plant up and kill it to see if there's nematodes. The plant knows it's got nematodes. <laughs> Why don't we listen to it? That's what we're doing.